Lynn, the next question comes from the U.S. It's, it um, addresses a, a similar issue from a slightly different standpoint. Um, let me just say that uh, this question stems from a meeting that we participated in yesterday that included uh, representatives from both the House and the Senate who are sponsoring, both from the West Coast, by the way, who are uh, sponsoring a bill that would provide for a, a very significant increase in the funding of the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program, uh, which is grossly underfunded. Uh, but th the question that they submitted is the following. They said, Mr. LaRouche, first, we'd like to thank you uh, for exposing uh, the travesty represented by, by the recent work of Robert Geller. Among those of us who have studied uh, this area, he is well known as an incredible cynic and someone who has always put forward the idea that Mother Nature hates humanity. And they actually have a funny note saying, you can only imagine what his family life must have looked like for him to arrive at such a conclusion. <laughs> but they say, they say but, but further, um, obviously by following your website and by discussions that we've had here, uh, it's obvious that you know that the whole question of precursors to earthquakes and, and other uh, related activity has been the source of debate for quite some time. What is very interesting to us and something that we would like you to comment on is that in your remarks, you have focused very much on the potential danger of earthquakes uh, and events following earthquakes on the west coast of the United States. And obviously this is a source of great concern. But what you may not be aware of uh, are recent exercises that were conducted well in the mainland of the United States in the Tennessee Valley. And we raise this for very specific reasons. These reasons also prevail on the West Coast, but the fact is that the Tennessee Valley, just during the course of the 20th century, was the scene of major earthquake activity. In measuring our preparedness, and they say that they were involved in this and also FEMA was involved in this, the results that we the, the results that we came to, that our studies came to, were in fact alarming. Because the fact of the matter is that with or without the ability to predict this sort of disaster, what we were faced with is that if in fact there was a recurrence of, for instance, an earthquake in the Tennessee Valley, our ability to do something as simple as evacuating people would be virtually impossible. The roads are in complete disrepair. The bridges, as I think you are well aware, under current conditions are not safe. In fact, there is only one bridge in the entire area that met the criteria of a safe bridge and that is without the occurrence of an earthquake. The irony is that when we were faced with the, with the Haitian earthquake, we had very concrete proposals and we had a specific plan, which unfortunately was rejected, to evacuate people from that island uh, and to move them to safe ground. The problem that we face in looking at many areas of the United States is that even if we put aside for a moment the precursor debate, the fact of the matter is that we do not have the means in our United States to address this. And we raise it for two reasons. 
We raised the question specifically on the obvious issue of preparedness for earthquakes and other natural disasters. But we also raise it because it brings to light the question of the complete disintegration of our, our most fundamental infrastructure. And therefore, it is, it is our argument that what we are dealing with when we talk about preparedness for earthquakes, et cetera, are the most basic questions of economics. And unfortunately, in, in, this, in the city of Washington, when people talk about economics, they tend to look at it in very mundane terms. How can you save this job? How can you save that job? What will be my cost of living increase, et cetera? And while we are not dismissing those questions as being relevant to economy, it seems to us that these larger questions really are what need to be addressed. And we'd like your comment on it. Yeah. Of course, I think some of us who are like old geezers like me were acquainted in their youth with the fact the Allegheny system is also has earthquake potentials. And we've experienced some of those sometimes, you know, in milder form, but we've been t promised that we could get something much more spectacular if we waited long enough. Maybe that time is coming. Uh, the key issue here is just to get at the thing from the back end to the front end, I would say. The back end being, what's the bottom line on this thing? Uh, the point is, is that let's talk about about $20 trillion. Let's talk about the infl high inflation in our system, the inflation of debt, represented by bailout. Hmm? Now, with Glass-Steagall, what happens to bailout? Hmm? Hmm? Therefore, that great part of that fund of debt comes back to the United States government for a good presidency to do something about it. Now, what can I do, say, with $15 trillion of assets to expend for employment of Americans who may be unemployed at this time in projects which are necessary for precisely these various reasons, such as building Nomapa, such as re reconstructing the TVA area, which is known historically to the TVA as to exactly what to do in this area. You've got the map to what to do there. You've got the tradition there what to do. So therefore, we have the ability, if we take the burden of this present Obama debt, let's call it Obama debt, it indicates that it's something fake. I mean, <laughs> people will recognize you call it Obama debt. They'll know, though, this is the phony stuff. All right, get rid of the Obama debt, and we give it to Wall Street. How? By Glass-Steagall. If it doesn't qualify for a Glass-Steagall standard, it belongs to Wall Street. It belongs to the... Now, Wall Street becomes, ha, 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 tell our British friends. Wall Street becomes the, dirt, the bad bank. And that's the thing we close down. Or we just don't let close it down, actually. We say, see if you can survive. It's up to you, buddy. We wash your hands of it. If you're so damn smart as you claim to be, you'll figure it out for yourself. <laughs> they probably set up a mafia system or something like that to try to. All right. If we then free the United States federal government from this swindle and take about $15 trillion of it. Huh? Put this back into the system. Now, not as money to look at, like this crazy Russian idea that we had talked about here earlier, huh? of storing the money away like money is an intrinsic asset. Money is not an intrinsic asset. Well, it never was, except for fools. What we do with the money is we say, this is credit. We don't call it money anymore. We call it credit. And we say this credit, well, it, long time, fine. What defines its long-term life? 
Well, it's usefulness. Highways, water systems, industries. In other words, we put people to work, producing wealth. Money is not wealth. Money should be used as credit for the creation of wealth. Can you eat money? Well, some people can. We should ask the president to do that. This is electronic money, not even paper money. It's electronic money. I'm not even sure it's electronic money. Maybe the shadow of non-existent electronic money. But anyway, we're freed of this damn debt. And the Federal Reserve System may have to be reorganized by a bad bank treatment because of what's been done to it by Geithner and so forth. But therefore, if we put, we now restore the states, it's very simple, Glass-Steagall. We restore the states to self-sufficient functioning as states. As states, they are then able with the aid, cooperation with the federal government in taking care of the communities, the hospitals, the schools, so forth, right? Opening up lines of employment for people who are presently unemployed. Hmm? Then uh, using that for works which are essential for the United States and for the states themselves. So now we, by increasing employment, by some we were aiming at something like 10 million people in productive employment in this area, the things I've got in mind. By increasing employment with that much, suddenly the United States, which was going bankrupt, now freed of this phony debt, which is given to its friends in Wall Street as a, as a souvenir. We now have restored the United States to a viable functioning as an economy. And we have encouraged Europe to join us in the celebration by doing the same thing to a fixed exchange rate system of this type. Hmm. What's happened to all our problems? Gee, how'd that happen? Well, we just decided not to recognize play money, not monopoly game, play money. We give that to our people in Wall Street to play with. They like to play with things. Go, let them go play with themselves. Right? <laughs> so therefore, we simply eliminate that factor. And as, as you know, you have to look back what the Hamilton did, with Alexander Hamilton. What he did, which is the key foundation on which the U.S. Constitution was based. So this, got it, this is serious stuff. This is the U.S. Constitution. This is not something from it. And forget all those funny interpretations. This is the U.S. Constitution. It was based on this. We had a bunch of states we, at, at the point of victory over the British. They were all bankrupt because of the war debt. So what did, what did Franklin do uh, huh? and others do? What did, they came up with this idea, which is the project of our dear Alexander Hamilton. They said, ah, this is a debt of the United States. It is not a debt of the individual state as such. So now instead of having a bunch of states like a British collection of slaves, you, you, now you had the United States is assuming the debt, the war debt of the separate states as a United States debt. This debt, now whose payment is now guaranteed by all of the states in the form of the federal government, is now then becomes a system of national banking. It's done by the US federal constitution. The intent of this action is expressed, what? In the preamble of the US federal constitution, which these crazy Republican queers don't like. The US federal constitution's preamble is the constitution. The intention of the existence and functions of the United States and any member of the Congress who doesn't understand that should leave the Congress for sanitary reasons. So now what happens, we, we were in the same situation. We got a bunch of crap on our hands. We, we established under our constitutional law. That law is still there. 
and any error overlooking it was a mistake. And you find out that you get wonderful results when the people of the United States are united around an issue like this. And the function of politics is to unite the people of the United States around this issue. And most of them will go for it right now because they don't like this system. They want to get, the, they want to get back to the good stuff. So therefore, that's our solution. So we have to, in a sense, without the intention to now proceed with, Glass, with the Glass-Steagall reform, back in immediately, without question, without doubt, without modification, without ifs, ands, and buts. Just stick it back in there, boy, in the original form. And don't fool with it. Because once the United States makes a distinction between what the merchant banking system, or so-called, has as debt, and what is the legitimate debt of the banks the commercial banks of the United States and related kinds of banking. You've solved the problem. The United States federal government assumes the responsibility for the support of the commercial banking system and its auxiliaries. Just the way the United States, under Hamilton's scheme, crafted the foundation of the U.S. federal constitution. Now we're going to back to work. We're taking our credit system with us and taking the paper claims of the merchant banking system and donating them to Wall Street and to London and let them try to digest that paper. That's their business, not ours. They just cannot commit any crimes in the process of doing so. So that is that's, that's our essential approach this whole thing. That's why I said start from the back end of this thing. All you have to do is do this properly and understand its implications. By this kind of reform, you immediately have created at least $15 trillion net of fungible lending power. The United States government is now responsible, as it was under the formation of the U.S. federal constitution, for doing this. This now becomes the credit of the U.S. federal government. It's debt in a credit system. We put that debt to work as Hamilton and company did with the U.S. federal constitution. We translate this debt into employment of people who are going to produce wealth. And the wealth they produce will redeem the value of this debt as we did with founding of our Constitution. And that's what we have to do now. So all these problems, including the ones mentioned here in the question, are intrinsically fungible in terms of solutions. All we have to do is do it. And the first thing we have to do before anything else, no ifs and or buts getting in the way, push this thing through, if you've got the guts to do it, buddy, vote it up overwhelmingly and chase this president out of office to some safe place where he can be protected from his own insanity and from his people who've come to hate him. Do that. And we have our country back. Once we have our country back, I would hope we would never let anybody take it away from us again.